There is a test that's often used to test the long-term durability of metals and coatings. It's called a salt spray test and you can test many years worth of corrosion in only a few hours. It's very punishing and it will ruin test samples quickly. The test consists of putting components in a chamber and spraying them gently with a mist of salt water. But if you really want to rock and roll, just take your car out to the Bonneville Salt Flats, especially when it's wet, and tow your race car around and drive it around through the salt, the water, and the salt water. Bonus points if you do this without a body on your car, so the salt gets in every little crack and crevice. This will put many years of corrosion into your car in just a few days, even though your car is pretty much brand new. Don't do this. It will ruin your car, and your trailer, and your RV, and your driveway. I have cleaned this car half a dozen times, and every time I do, I find new pockets of salt and corrosion. The only way to really fix this is to do what I should have done immediately when I got home, and that is to completely disassemble the car and totally rebuild it. This car has sat under this table here since Bonneville Speed Week several months ago, slowly corroding away because I did not want to look at it. This is not a fun project, but it needs to be done. So I called up my massively overqualified intern Dave and we started taking it apart. We kept track of all the tools we used to disassemble the car so I can make a toolkit that just follows the car. At first we wrote down everything we used on the whiteboard, but after a bit we decided to just leave it in a big pile and then at the end of disassembly we wrote them all down. I pieced together a toolkit based on that list, and the plan is to only use this tool set when we reassemble the car. That way, if something's missing, we'll know. This kit is missing some key things. We didn't take the engine apart, so we didn't use any of those tools. Most of those required tools should be contained in this set, except for Torx, which we didn't use, but we might need for some engine stuff later. We also didn't do any wiring, so I made a small wiring fix kit. I know I'm missing some tools, but I'm trying to keep this somewhat light. I don't want every single possible tool for every possible fix. If I blow a hole in a piston, I'm not going to fix it on the salt flats. I'm just going to go home. Also, there are hardware stores in driving distance and a hundred other teams, most of which would be happy to let me borrow a tool for a moment if I needed. Some stuff on this car was worse than others. The front suspension did not do well. The front wheel bearings did not have enough protection or enough grease, and they were pretty much ruined. I'll be replacing these with these standard roller bearings, sealed up and absolutely jam-packed with grease. The bearings did fare better than the steering, which was so bad it was stuck in place. We had to use the press to get it apart. It wasn't this bad when we unloaded the car, but the salt water just slowly corroded things into place. It turns out I forgot to lubricate it. There is a Zerk fitting on the top that's there to squeeze these things full of grease so this doesn't happen, and not a drop of grease was to be found. The U-joint for the steering was also trashed. I did kind of half-ass the spray painting on this, so that's not too surprising. Speaking of things I forgot to do, the coolant system is filled with mineral deposits. That's because I filled this thing with hose water to get it running and never bothered to swap it out for distilled water. So now I have to figure out how to flush the system out. The exhaust was ceramic coated, but it didn't hold up that well to the salt, unfortunately. Most of the fasteners had some corrosion. The yellow zinc coated ones fared well, except the nuts did a lot worse than the bolts. Hose clamps did pretty poorly. Black oxide all got destroyed, and my brake lines will need to be replaced. Most of the braided steel lines did okay, but the fittings at the end got trashed. Although, the ones from Russell did well. Good job, Russell. We made a makeshift engine stand using some zip ties and 2x4s. The engine was pretty bad. Salt and dirt and corrosion all over. I fixed this one up with a blast from the power washer. Actually, the power washer came in really handy for this whole thing. The frame was pretty ugly in the engine bay area, but actually pretty much fine in front of the firewall. The pressure washer did a good job of cleaning up the rear. It looked really bad, but a lot of this was just surface corrosion, dirt, leftover salt, and other non-cancerous stuff. By the way, I painted this frame with Steel It. It's a paint that has stainless steel in it. It's supposed to be good at dealing with corrosion, and you can weld through it. Honestly, pretty impressed with this stuff. It's not in the best condition, but this is about the most corrosive environment possible, and it held up better than most of the other coatings, including some zinc-coated fasteners. There were parts of the frame that had salt packed on for a couple of weeks and it didn't corrode through the paint. It just rusted where the bottom of the car had been dragged along the trailer repeatedly. The engine bay was not quite as good, but it held up pretty well. The places that were rusted were the places where I kind of did a half-ass touch-up job. Anyway, steal it. Pretty good. Which is good because it's real expensive. The power washer took care of a surprising amount of surface corrosion on the frame, but I did have to go back and sand and wire brush out some of the rust. I painted the frame with a primer that encapsulates and converts rust. There wasn't really any noticeable rust left, but uh, just in case. Then I recoated the whole thing in another layer of steel it. The whole thing. So remember when I made the trailer, I talked about adding cup and cone locators? 
I will at some point add cones to the front and rear crossbars and cups to the bottom of the land speed car to secure it in. We'll figure out that part later. Well, it's later. The cones were easy enough to lathe out of some aluminum I had lying around. The cups were a little more of a hassle and not actually cups. I should have just had these laser cut out, but I got impatient and used some stainless I had lying around. I used a step drill, so they have a nice cone effect inside, even though they're flat. I wanted to use stainless since they'll be rubbing on the cones, and since even with the body, they'll be exposed to the salt. I did have to move a ton of stuff in my garage to get my welder outside, since my rear door is blocked with a shelf. We got the cones located on the trailer by hanging the frame and slowly lowering it onto the trailer crossbars. We centered the cones and the cups by using some painter's tape, so hopefully in the future the car will just drop right back down onto the cones, making loading and unloading super simple. I also sprayed the inside of the trailer frame and the car frame with this stuff. It comes with a hose that you shove into holes and just blast the inside of the tube with paint. Hopefully this will keep the trailer from rusting out from the inside. I also want to sleeve these holes here so I should be able to mostly seal up the frame, or at least better than it is right now. With the frame painted and the cups welded on, it was time to assemble everything. To do this, we decided to elevate the car to make it easier to work on. My sawhorses are pretty janky, so we made a new one, and then realized we didn't have enough wood for a second one. Then I realized my shop stool works perfectly. I did design some send cut send wild overkill sawhorses, which I will make soon. To lift the car onto the stands, we use the trailer, which is conveniently made to lift this car. Unfortunately, it does not quite lift it high enough. I need to slightly shorten the front and rear cables, but in the meantime, we just removed the middle pulley. I guess I could also just cut and re-weld this further back. The engine was the first thing to go in. Thankfully, I have an engine hoist that I use about once a year. Since I had the front apart, I went ahead and changed the caster angle. I did this once before, but after driving at Bonneville, I decided it needed more, especially after seeing everyone else's. Caster is the angle that your wheel pivots about when looking at it from the side. A lot of caster like this will make a car want to go straight, which is good because this car only goes straight. I also mostly redid the wiring. I had most of the electronics behind the seat. I wanted to keep them out of the hot engine bay, but that meant having a huge bundle of wires running through the firewall. The firewall needs to be watertight, both for rules and because I don't want to be on fire. It ends up just being a lot easier to have the electronics in the back section, so I got an enclosure, had send cut send laser cut me some mounts, and put it here in the back. It's pretty far from the exhaust, and I'll put some sort of cooling fan situation here at some point, but this makes wiring way more simple. With the engine in, the fuel system hooked up, and the electronics stuffed back in there, we decided to make sure it still works. So I switched on the electronics, and I realized I hadn't actually hooked up the fuel system yet. That's not normal. So, we got fuel everywhere. Thankfully, we remembered to locate the fire extinguishers first. More thankfully, there was no fire. After cleaning that all up and attaching the fuel line, it still wouldn't start. I pretty quickly realized this was the inertia switch. This is just a switch that shuts off the engine if you get into a crash. I just set it down too hard and it popped off. With that fixed... Yay! I still don't have the wheels on. I've been going back and forth about the front steering. I'd like to do a lever push rod thing from the handlebars that push levers that pivot in the middle and then push lower push rods to steer. I haven't designed this up yet beyond this incredibly crude animation that looks like it was engineered by my Canadian friend. I'm not your friend, buddy! I still kind of want to be able to have suspension up front, but I think I'm just going to go rigid for now and get it running. Adding back suspension can be a future upgrade because I have plenty of now upgrades to do. In the rear, I was assembling my swing arm when I noticed this. These are divots from the needle bearings I'm using inside the swing arm. The bearings are rated for the loads that I'm seeing here, but this is just a mild steel sleeve, so the hardened bearings squished little dents into the sleeve. The solution for this is to get the hardened steel bearing sleeve that was supposed to be here in the first place. That can just go where the bearings are, and I can use mild steel for the rest of it. I also ditched the needle thrust bearings that were here. These got salt water on them and were just completely destroyed. There's not much side load here and very little movement, so I got some corrosion-resistant bushings to replace them. I also got rid of a stack of several shims and replaced them all with one shim on either side that was just the correct width. The controls on this car are all motorcycle style. The throttle is a twist on the right hand. I had two cables running back, one push and one pull, so if the throttle gets stuck, I can hopefully roll it back. This kind of sucked. The cables were long and the routing had several curves, so the actual throttle feel was really bad. In fact, I had to get pretty strong springs just to make sure the throttle would stay closed. 
So I decided to switch to a throttle by wire system. Pretty much every car made for the last decade and most motorcycles use a system like this. The grip has a couple of sensors in it. The throttle plate has a couple of sensors and there's a computer in the middle that looks at all of the redundant sensors, makes sure everything looks good and opens the throttle plate the appropriate amount. On most cars, the advantage of this system is that you can have traction control, idle, and different throttle maps for different gears and situations, but I'm doing none of this. This is strictly a packaging thing for me and it helps a lot. The grip side comes from a Harley Davidson and actually goes inside the tube. There's an outer plastic piece that slides over the tube and everything is so nicely packaged in there. I love this. It did require me to cut off the old handlebars and replace them with larger tubes. Most motorcycles use 22 millimeter handlebar tubes, but Harley uses one inch, which is about 25 millimeters. This did mean that I had to modify the clutch and brake levers, but that was easy enough using a step drill. The throttle plate side is from a Mercedes, and in between is a standalone controller from RM Racing Electronics. The pins on this connector are the most difficult pins I've ever had to crimp. I screwed up half of them and then managed to botch the actual connector. Then I figured out Nissan uses this connector on its engine control units for a few years, so I bought a pigtail on eBay, crimped on my wires, and Bob's your uncle. I am having some trouble getting this to work. I had it working, but now it's not, and I'm not sure why, but I'll figure it out. There are a handful of off-the-shelf drive-by wire controllers ranging in price from $150 to $600 or so. The quality of the enclosures, anyway, seem to be commensurate with the cost. There are a few people who have made Arduino controller modules, and I have a couple of those lying around, so I could probably just make two of them and throw a spare one in the toolbox. I don't need any of the bells and whistles, I just need this to rotate when I rotate this. Seems like I could make this happen for like $50. Bucks. I do still need to make an adapter for the throttle plate to my intake, and I've already made an adapter for the air filter to the new throttle using the magic of 3D printing. I've held off on getting a 3D printer for a long time because I used them like 15 years ago, and so my brain still thinks they're minefields of errors and maintenance. But I have been convinced that they are reliable now, which is only partly true. On average so far, I've had to fix something once every other print. People call this a hobby, but I'm not really looking for a hobby. I just want a thing that makes other things reliably preferably. Anyway, I printed that adapter. I also made some cones to locate the land speed car onto my dolly thing. Plastic is probably not the best material for this, but I was kind of curious how well this printed polycarbonate will hold up, so we'll see. I also made a benchy, which is this little benchmark boat thing, and what I call the demonetized benchy. This car will never again go to the salt flats without a full body, and even then I'm going to make sure the wheel wells are as sealed off as they can be. I might not even take it to El Mirage without a body, the dust will get everywhere anyway, but I would like this car to last more than a couple of seasons before it's fully corroded. Replacing all of the bolts and hose clamps gets surprisingly expensive, but next time I will be more proactive. I will clean the car immediately when I get back. I mean, I say that, but I know how lazy Future Matt is, so we'll see.